morning. Great to see you all here this morning. All right, in just a second, I'm going to put up a quote. Don't look at who said it, okay? Don't look at the, don't cheat, don't look at the end. But if I were to ask you to name a billionaire who was famous for his computers and his tech kind of savvy, who would you say? Okay, all right, great. All right, well, let's look at this quote here because I think it is fascinating. Technology is a boom or bust business, but it's mostly busts. I've always assumed that 10% of my technology investments will succeed and succeed wildly. The other 90% I expect to fail. Bill Gates, some of you guessed it right away. Did you catch that? 90% failure rate? Are you kidding? Who would make an investment like that? If 90% of Bill Gates' technology investments fail, I think that is a great reminder that nothing is a surefire investment. Oh, that is except for God's word, which pays a divine dividend. See what I did there, right? It has an eternal reward. That means spending time in God's word is actually an investment. You're not spending anything. You are investing. It's an investment for eternity. So when you study the Bible every day, your ROI, that's your return on investment, huh? Like that, Elliot? Got our investor down here? I did my homework. Your return on investment is actually 100%. Is there anybody here who would like a 100% investment on your 401k return, right? Elliot, what's the, uh, what's the savings rate, or investment uh, interest rate at savings? Say 0.01. 0.01, yes. Yet we have 100% return on our investment when we study God's Word. If you were here last week, you kind of saw that. That's what we do. We start with the Word. I'm going to say a few verses, and I want you to see if one word jumps out at you repeatedly. Forever, O Lord, your Word is settled in heaven. And it's the Psalm 119, later on in the same chapter. The, entire, the entirety of your word is truth, and ever endures forever. Psalm 117. The truth of the Lord endures forever. Are you seeing the trend? You're hearing the word over and over again? There's one word. Even in the New Testament, 1 Peter says this. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And Jesus himself we read in Matthew 24, he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but not my words. My words will endure forever. They shall never pass away. It is literally eternal. It is, you know, and I know sometimes it's, we're kind of one of those Bible-believing churches that gets accused of ignoring the Holy Spirit. And some say we, our Trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bible. But it's, it's not necessary. We just revere God's word. And we should. We should hold it up as our standard. In Ephesians 5, we read last week that God commands us to literally redeem the time knowing that the days are evil. So we could literally do the will of the Lord. This is our mission, to be about the business of the Father. Jesus was our example. So how do we redeem the time? What is it we do? Well, we're looking at the life of Jesus to learn some biblical principles that help us manage our time better as followers of Christ, knowing that the days are fleeting, knowing that these days are evil. And because we established, even though life in the first century was drastically different, Jesus still had the same human limitations we do when it comes to time. Think about this. He had people pulling him in a million different directions. Some things were good. Some were legitimate concerns coming up, tugging on him, literally. We'll see in just a minute. Yet he found a way to figure out what was most important. So last week... The first principle I left you with, if you're a note taker, it's probably the most important step to redeeming our time. Start with the word. That's principle number one. To redeem our time in the model of our redeemer, we have to know the author of time. We have to. We have to know what he says. What's his purpose for the world? What has he called us to do with the days we're given with that? Are we maximizing these days that he's given us? Nearly 200 years ago, the great Presbyterian minister, James Alexander, put it like this. He said this. The study of God's word for the purpose of discovering God's will is the secret discipline which has formed the greatest characters. Did you catch that? Studying God's that's the secret sauce. That is it. That is the secret discipline. And so this week, we're going to look at how nobody, and I mean nobody in Jerusalem, had more to do than Jesus. No one had more people pulling and competing for his attention than the Lord Jesus. Nobody had more things on his plate than Jesus, and yet he always seemed to be able to discern the ascent from the noise, right? That constant buzzing. You hear it, right? I hear it right now, right? There's, there's just that constant turmoil, that constant unsettledness. That you're being pulled that it's never enough. 
You ever felt like that? You lay down in bed, and you know you worked your tail off. And yet you think, I didn't get it done. You ever felt like that? And I don't want to get out of bed tomorrow because I know what awaits me tomorrow. I just can't seem to get it all done. I can't get ahead. Jesus knows. He's our high priest that can identify with us. Remember, he had people grasping at him. He had people pulling for him. Did you ever wonder how he was able to get it all done? How, here's, here's a question. How was he able to say no to multitudes of people who needed healing? People who, because he did, did you know that? He didn't heal everyone. He didn't go, he didn't spend from sun up to sun just doing that. There was other things. He had a deeper mission than temporary healing. Did you know that? So how did he say no? How did he differentiate from what was most important to what was somewhat lesser? I think in our crazy, overscheduled, rat race lifestyles, that is an awesome question for us today. All right, so let me set the context of what we're going to read. Look at Mark 1. You can hold your place there. Just going to want to set the context. Around verse 21, something crazy happens. Jesus is walking into his local synagogue. It's the Sabbath. But instead of a typical worship experience, he's teaching a little bit. People are amazed. They're like, what? Where does he get this authority? He's unlike anyone else they've seen. He's not like the scribes. He's not like the Pharisees. But he's teaching. And then in the middle of this worship experience, a demon-possessed man comes up and begins to disrupt the service, begins to yell at him. Can you picture it? Can we act it out? Right? It's this demon-possessed man. What have you to do with us? Right? Have you come to destroy us? I just picture this horrifying voice. And then they say something very shocking. We know who you are. The Holy One of God. How do they know that? And why is he referred to singular, but yet when the demon speaks, he says we. Did you ever catch that? It's so incredible. And Jesus silences him. It's a silence. Come out. That's all he had to say. The demon convulsed him and he left him. And people were freaking out. Okay, this is supposed to be a church. Now imagine if that happened right now. Imagine if L.A. was on the ground just flopping and she was oh, we know who you are. You know, what would we do? That's how disruptive this was, okay? It's like, silence, be gone. And we do. <laughs> no, you've never done that. It's what I'm saying. <laughs> Think about how disruptive this was. But look how Jesus handled it. And the people were amazed. They were in shock. Like, who is this that even the demons have to obey? This is our Lord. That's who he is. He is the savior of the world. He's not just a good guy. He's not just a prophet. He is God's son. He is God incarnate. This is why we worship him. This is why we love him. So he does this amazing stuff, and the people are wanting more time with him. Okay? So we pick up the story right here, already in action. Look, reading in verse 29. So as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mom-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her. He took her hand, he helped her up, and the fever left her. And she began to actually wave on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door. Picture that. Can you imagine all of Holly Springs, Fuquay, Apex, all Chapel, showing up at, the, at your doorstep? Like, ah, uh, don't, you're not done, are you? I got some, this guy's, he needs something. Can you imagine? Picture it. We read these words and we just gloss over it. It says, the whole town gathered at the door. Then Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak. There it is. He said silence earlier because they knew who he was. Of course they did. They saw him in the spirit realm. They know. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus was tired because he stayed up too late watching Netflix. So, oh, wait a minute. I'm so sorry. That was someone else. Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone's looking for you. Of course they are. Can you imagine? Everyone's looking for you. Jesus replied, well, let's go to him quickly if they're looking for me. Look at what he says. It's bizarre. He says, eh, let's go somewhere else. <laughs> Wait, what? Well, let's go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. This is why I've come. But Jesus, don't you understand? You've got your audience here. You've got everything you need. There's people lined up. You don't have to go. We've we got a nice comfy bed. We've got food coming. He says, no. Nah. Think about that. Recap what just happened. He's just preached at the synagogue. He's cast out some evil spirits. Jesus has healed Peter's mother-in-law. Now a bunch of her neighbors are here. Understandably, as a result, the whole town wants more of Jesus. A lot more. 
But Jesus essentially says, no thanks. Why? You know why? Because he had already committed his time to a bigger yes. Did you catch that? He already knew. Look again at his response there, that last verse. The people's request for more time. And he says, hey, let's go somewhere else. In other words, we can't stay. I got to go. I got other things to do. Uh, this is important. It's right there. It's probably number two or three. But there's a number one, a bigger yes. Okay? So in other words, Jesus said no because he was committed to a bigger yes. This is so powerful. Jesus understood his purpose. That allowed him to pass the things he should do. Do you know what I'm saying? He distilled this down. He knew the things he should do. And as John 17 tells us, it is to finish the work the Father gave him to do. See, once Jesus had his priorities in the right order, he focused relentlessly on them. It freed him up. He knew his mission. It wasn't to please that person or this person or do what you thought or had thought. It was to please the work and do the will of the Father. All right, so what about you? You know, I love to get practical. I'm just your friendly neighborhood pastor trying to give some advice here. So many of us become paralyzed because we have way too much on our plate. We have way too many decisions to make. We are way, way too overprogrammed. Way too overprogrammed. We're also, I'm just going to say it, way too overstimulated. We're constantly, constantly, we don't like silence. My generation, generation after me, we don't even know what silence is. We're so overwhelmed. We're so inundated with options. And a lot of these things are good things, but good things can paralyze us. Good things can overwhelm us to where we actually freeze up with indecision. You ever know somebody who does that? They freeze up. We see it in the movies all the time. Like these big battle things are going, right? And the general's over here, and then all of a sudden the general gets killed. And like the lieutenant colonel's looking around, and the war starting to turn against him. And they're like, they're fired. And they're like, and all of a sudden, all the little privates and the lieutenants are running up to him going, Sir, sir, who's in charge? And they look around, and they, he's the last, the highest rank. And they're like, looks like you are, sir. And he just, you just kind of see his eyes go wide, and he looks around, and he sees the carnage. And the bullets are whizzing by, and it's just, it's just awful. And he just freezes. Until finally, one of the lieutenants comes up and says, Sir, what are your orders? Sir, what are your orders? Like, we need to, see, he froze up. It's normal. That's what we do. You know why? Because we're reactive. He froze up, and we see these things. There's this great quote from Kevin DeYoung. He's a great pastor, and it stood out. He said this, the people on this planet who end up doing nothing are usually those who didn't realize they couldn't do everything. What? Read that again. That is incredible. The people who end up paralyzed or doing nothing is because they realize they couldn't do everything. And so, I just can't do it all. I don't know what to do. And they just, they paralyzed. They didn't prioritize their, their, their life. Okay, so this is so good. Where Jesus' example here is so perfect. And this is our next biblical principle for redeeming our time. Prioritize your yeses. Prioritize your yeses. To redeem our time in the model of our Redeemer, we have to decide what matters most and then allow those choices to prioritize what our commitment is for that day. For some of you here today, this one principle is what will free you up. This is what you came for. You didn't even know why you walked in these doors. This is why. Not everything on your to-do list carries equal weight. Did you know that? It just doesn't. Well, Pastor, you haven't seen my list. It's long. It's all important. I didn't say that. But not everything on your list is a kingdom priority. I know that's not popular, but it's biblical. Not everything on your to-do list is equally important. The truth is not all your yeses are created equal. Not everything carries equal weight. It just doesn't. So how can we, like Jesus, identify the work that matters most and prioritize everything else after that? Okay, remember, last week we saw we must spend, or invest is a better word, spend and invest time alone with the Father. Be in his word. Spend time with him in prayer. Silence the distractions. Create that space for silent reflection, okay? We must also grasp the fact that you and I have the power to choose our schedule. You and I have the power to choose what matters most rather than allowing the world to dictate that. But if you look at the world, it's just the opposite. That's the reality most of us live by. We let the outside world dictate what we do, where we go, what time we're there. Think about this, and let's face it. Most people operate under the assumption 
that you're out of control, that your schedule is pre-planned, and you really don't have much say in it. You know why? Because we tend to be reactive rather than proactive. All right, so let's get practical. You know I love to bring it down. When you look at this, going through your day, just go through your day, say last week or so, which one were you more often? Hey, think about your schedule. As you go through your day, ask yourself, who is in charge of how you spend your time? Are you reactive? Are you proactive? What was Jesus? What about your priorities? What about the things that you actually spent all this, this precious time? Remember, we're called to redeem the time. What was it that consumed most of your waking hours? If I asked your spouse, no, better, if I asked your kids to create a pie graph of where you spent your time. In fact, some of your children did that today, and I want to display a couple of those. Right? I'm just kidding. I didn't do that. But it would be cool. It would be very revealing. I saw some of you like, what's that? He already mentioned something about Netflix. I don't even know how to turn it on, but thankfully. How did you spend your day? What were your priorities? Because, see, how you handle that affects everything else. You know how you will handle your interruptions that come? It affects your kids. It affects the time you have to invest in your health. There are so many things that will get squeezed out if you are reactive and you are not proactive. If you do not protect your time, if you do not redeem your time in the model of our Redeemer, everything else will squeeze in and will do that. Think about this. You know, almost every person that comes up to you has a reason. And almost every person that comes up has a reason. Most of the time, if you think about it, it's to accomplish their priorities or answer their question, not yours. Think about that. And they're not bad. They can even be good questions. They can even be good things that they need you for. There's nothing wrong with that. We do it all the time, right? But think about, isn't it funny how no one ever comes up to you and says, hey, I just want you to have seven uninterrupted hours to focus on your priorities today. In fact, I'm going to stand guard at the door and make sure no one interrupts you. Never has that happened. Because we're so focused. We come, we have our to-do list, you know, like, hey, man, you know what? My stuff can wait. Why don't you just accomplish your goals today? But when you look at the Gospels, it is obvious Jesus was crystal clear on what work was most important. And because of that, he was able to prioritize his limited, precious time on earth. And that is our example. Jesus is our model. He was not afraid to say no to the lesser stuff. Because he knew he could only be one place at a time. And that's our next huge truth grenade today. Accept your uni presence. If you're a note taker, there you go. Accept your uni presence. This is a funny word, right? We think of like unicorn and unibrow and all these things. Uni presence. We're kind of familiar with this, this word because we, we, we think like the universe, right? And, you know, we hear things like in, in the Marvel world, we've got this, uh, the multiverse has come out and all these, these huge things. The next movie's coming out. You see that I'm not doing any spoilers for that movie that came out last week or whatever. Just, that's as close as I'm going to get. We're familiar with universe and multiverse and omniverse and things like that. But we're not familiar with unipresence. Omni meaning many. Uni meaning one, right? Omni meaning all inclusive, uni. God is omnipresent. But Jesus, when he came and became flesh, embraced the human limitations of being unipresent. He was just like us in that regard. Whereas God could be omnipresent everywhere, his father all the time. Jesus in the flesh could not be in two places at the same time, and neither can we. He was unipresent. Remember, never forget Jesus had to deal with the same challenges we face today to redeem the time. He had the frequent distractions. He had interruptions. All these things that were competing for his attention, uninvited, sometimes unscheduled situations happened to him all the time. Look at Mark 10, right? We see this. A man literally throws himself at the feet of Jesus as he's walking down the road to go do something else. man comes and kneels before him. What did Jesus do with that one? You can read that on your own. A woman came up. Again, Jesus was on route to another place. A woman comes up, touches his cloak, temporarily stopping and distracting Jesus because he knew immediately, whoa, whoa, who touched me? Power's gone out. Power went out of me. Who did that, right? Think about that. He was already going somewhere, but yet there was a temporary stoppage. One time, a man was literally dropped through the roof over Jesus' head as Jesus was preaching. Do we really grasp 
how bizarre and how striking that would be. Imagine if that happened right here today while I was teaching. Well, in fact, to illustrate that, I've arranged for two guys to be, uh, go ahead, guys. No, I didn't. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. We'd get it. We'd be like, what? That is so bizarre. Again, we read over the script. They're alive. And we gloss over that. We don't understand. These friends were so desperate to get their friend to Jesus. Are we? Or do we even say anything? Do we even invite anybody? Y'all look around. The world is on fire. They need what we have. And we can't do this. Hide it under a bushel. Yes. <laughs> no. I'm going to let it shine. They need to know this. These friends were tenacious. Are we? Not long ago, I just read about some scientists who did a cool, very clever experiment about this very concept. But they didn't do it with humans. They did it with ants. And they placed a drop of honey, a little bit of syrup, on a uh, top of a pedestal. And within minutes, dozens of tiny ants that were nearby began to detect the aroma of the syrup. They knew that food was nearby. They could sniff it out. Some of you got that superpower too, right? You can, there's food nearby. Within minutes, they began to form a trail. And they started to climb this pedestal to reach up to get to the source of food. But the scientists would come and would knock the ants off. Don't worry, no ants were harmed in this. Don't call PETA. This is, this is a scientific experiment. And they knocked them off. Now check this out. Those little worker ants kept trying over and over. Not just 10 times, not just 50 times, not 80 times, but the scientists noted over 100 times. Those ants, boom, after they got knocked down, they went right back up because they were hungry for the source. Oh, you see where I'm going spiritually. They were so hungry for the source. They were tenacious. Nothing was going to stop them. They were repeatedly knocked down. Even the scientists had to explain God must have built some hardwired, incredible determination into even the tiniest of creatures. And I got to thinking about that, and I wonder if sometimes we get discouraged too easily, and we give up. Sometimes I think we get too distracted, or something comes, boom, and flicks us and knocks us down. And I said, I'm out. <laughs> I'm done. I'm taking my ball and go home. I tried. We get distracted and discouraged too easily. Think about these ants. These friends, they were trying to help a paralyzed man get to Jesus. This probably wasn't the first time. They didn't just go to that level extreme. They were probably outside the crowd the night before and over places. Finally said, we got to do something before he leaves town. And they were all so in that they opened up the roof and dropped him down. And Jesus rewarded their faith and their cleverness, and he healed them. They were so focused on the mission. Did you catch that? The highest priority for them, and nothing would deter them. So here's the deal. There were times where Jesus welcomed some distractions like this. Make no mistake about it. But if you look deeper, it was only if they aligned with his kingdom purpose. And there it is. When the distractions come your way this week, take a moment to step back and ask yourself, Holy Spirit, is this the best use of my time? Does this advance your kingdom in any way? And if there's other things on your to-do list that do, and this saying yes stops you from doing it, it's not from God. Okay? We put stuff on our list that the Lord never intended us to do. Guess what? It's not his fault. That's on us. We have the power to follow Jesus' example, to say no. He only said yes if they aligned with his kingdom purpose. Other times, Jesus actually made significant effort to eliminate distractions. So he could proceed around them to his mission. Even when others disagreed. Even when others said, ah, I don't think that's right. I don't think, you didn't pray and ask for my will. Right? Let me tell you how you should run your life. You have that happening all the time. What do you do with it? Look what Jesus, this is the most bizarre, strange passage in Matthew. It's in Matthew 12. I'll put it up for you. And check it out. Look at what he says here. He says, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brother stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, uh, hey, Jesus, your mom and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. And he replied to them, oh, they're here? Well, I better go right now. That's what we think. Who is this? He says, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And then pointing to his disciples around him, he says, 
right here are my mother and my brothers, my sister. For anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, my sister, and my mother. This is so strange on the surface. And most of us get caught up in the surface reading in the message here of Jesus' words about who is and who's not in his family. But when you focus on that only, you miss the incredible B story happening here. There is a sub-story, a subtext going on. What is Jesus doing in this moment? He's working. Did you catch that? Because I missed it. He is working. He is talking to the crowd, literally doing the work the Father sent him to do, namely preaching in this moment, the gospel of the kingdom. All of a sudden, his blood relatives show up, and they're waiting outside. And Jesus basically says, put them on hold. Wait, what? That's not biblical. What, what are you doing, Jesus? You're breaking the rules. Don't, don't you know the rule? God first, family second, work third? I mean, don't they? Jesus continued teaching. Why? In that moment, he was being obedient to his highest priority. He was doing the will of the Father. See, in that moment, he was so focused, he was fully present with the task at hand because he knew his mission. Do we? Do we know why we're here? Are we making any impact in our sphere of influence that God's given each one of us? There are people in your sphere of influence you come in contact with, I will never be able to reach. Just like there are people and neighbors and friends in my circle, you will never be able to come in contact with. You just won't. Even if Kevin Bacon shows up with six degrees of separation, you will never get to him. See, that's on me. And your sphere of influence depends on you being obedient to the kingdom work that the Father has called him to do. He knew his highest priority. See, he didn't even let his family become an idol that would rank above his Father, God. Think about that. That is so against our Americanized version of the gospel. Think about this. This is, this is so radical. He knew his mission was to preach the gospel. He didn't even let blood relatives become an idol that ranked higher than God. Man, we need to hear that reminder today. So many people, good people, you and I know, have unknowingly placed even family above their obedience to God. It is easy to do. I've done it. We see it all the time. But the truth is, Jesus always had his priorities in proper order. And as scripture says, because of that, he was fully pleasing to the Father. And there it is. Isn't that what we all want? At the end of our days, this vapor we have, don't we want to hear, oh, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what I want to hear. But you notice another subtext here? There's a bonus truth grenade hiding right here. When you see that when he was with his family, Later on, and he was with his friends, he was fully with them. He was so focused on them, he was protecting that time. Think about this. I mean, you, you see this all the time when you go out. When you go out on a date, just look around, okay? I want you to look at some younglings around you. And they're on this date, and they're all dressed up and fancy, and they stare at each other a little bit awkwardly, and they, hey, you want the breadstick? You don't? Okay, I'll eat it, right? And then within minutes, here comes the phone, and they're scrolling, right? Both of them. Me and Amy are like, Look at them, totally ignoring each other. They don't even realize, but you know what this is saying? This is saying, what's happening here is more interesting than what's happening with you. Like, I, I'll get to you later. No, you won't get to You're at Olive Garden. Dude, you're shelling out big bucks. <laughs> you missed the window where it was like half price cheese sticks and whatever. That's just what we say. We don't mean to. I would never say to her, hey, you're, this is a little bit more important. You're secondary. But let me get you see this all the time, where people are so, they're there, but they're not really present, right? You ever done that? Where you come home from work and you didn't prioritize well enough and your kids come in and they start talking to you, oh man, it's confession time. They're not in there, are they? Good, all right, they're working in the back. I can't tell you how many times Milo and Mary come in, oh, dad, I'm like, uh-huh, yeah, is that right? Hang on, I'm going to return his text real quick. What's that? Yeah, that's funny. Anybody else? Confession? Right? He don't even know. I was there, but I really wasn't there. And they're not dumb. You know they walk away and go, there goes dad. Not fully here. Still dealing with work. And I missed that moment. So check out what Jesus does next. This is so cool. Mark chapter 9. 
They've just been working. He's been fully present in the mission. And then it says in verse 30, he says they left that place. They passed through Galilee. Jesus didn't want anyone to know where they were because now he was going to focus on his disciples. Did you catch that? This is so cool. See, once Jesus' work was done, once he had completed the work of the Father for the day, Jesus was now intentional, and he was fully focused on those closest to him. He was fully invested in those 12 that were around. It's beautiful. See, he had his priorities right. Okay, So recap what we've seen so far. We've now seen three timeless management principles modeled in the life of Christ. Principle number one from last week, start with the word. Start with the word. All else starts there. I'm just going to be flat out honest. My opinion means squat. God's word is what matters. Doesn't matter what we think if it contradicts God's word. Does that make sense? We're going to to be bold. We're allowed to say that. We're saying, okay, all right. Start with the word. The word is where we get our marching orders. Principle number two, prioritize your yeses. You can't say yes to everything. If you do, you're going to start saying no to some things that are kingdom principles. You're going to say no to some things that are family. You're going to say no to some things that you really need to be saying yes for. Don't let people pull you a thousand different directions. Principle number three, accept your uni presence. I'm not going to pretend that that's easy. I struggle with this. I'm almost 50 years old. I still struggle with this. This is not easy. But you know what? Being a Christ follower isn't. I'm so tired of this bamby-pamby, half-baked, limp wrist gospel. That just says, just believe Jesus and all your problems will disappear. And it's a sugar-coated world. That's not in the Bible. Following Jesus takes guts. Living for the Lord flies in the face of this world out here. And if you don't sense any opposition coming against you, you're marching the same way. No wonder they'll leave us alone. But when we're distinct and we are called out and we're living our purpose... We should stick out like a thumb. I mean, it's, there's something different about you. Yeah, it did for Jesus. Man, that guy never blended in. Think about this. This is not easy. It is hard to prioritize, hard to focus. It takes intentionality. Jesus shows that when he was pulled in so many different directions, okay? Now, I want to emphasize, I'm going to leave you with a couple truths here, and we're going to change it up. We're going to end differently today. Remember the very first thing I said last week. Jesus offers us peace. Before we do anything. You need to hear that. Jesus' starting place is peace. He's called the Prince of Peace. Okay? So if you are in turmoil and you are constantly stressed out, we're not, we're not resembling the Father or the Son in this moment. Right? He offers us peace before. We don't have to do any of these practices to be loved by God. We don't have to do any of these to have his love, his favor, to have all of his blessings. Think about this, okay? It's because of his love that we want to be faithful. To redeem the time. It's out of that love. We didn't earn it. We're not like a slave. Like, if I do, did I please the Father today? It's not about that. You do not have, we are acting out of love because of what he has done for us. He's called us to redeem the time so we can spend more time doing his will. All right? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to leave you with a quick word of encouragement. And then Pastor Bill is going to come up in just a second and close us out with some exciting stuff here. Did anyone see the Olympics this past time that came up? <laughs> yeah, apparently not many did, right? And that's my point. Why don't you look at those stands? Why don't you look at the stadiums on each of these? Why don't you look at the players, like lined up, like look, facing the empty stands? It was abysmal. The ratings were horrendous. These kids had worked so hard. But because of a mysterious virus that was going around, the stadiums were empty, the stands were vacant, even the cheers were gone. Or worse, on some channels... They were fake. They were piped in. Fake applause. <sighs> you out of the moment. You ever watched a sitcom with a horrible laugh track? I can't even do it. I'm like, what? Who is in the room? What? Turn that off. This is what they were. Now I want you to put yourself in their position. There was no applause. The ratings were down. These athletes, many of whom had worked their entire life for this moment, were now performing in empty, huge, cavernous stadiums. You hear crickets, the silence. They didn't feel the rush, the normal applause, the shouts, the fans, the encouragement. Okay? And it made me think about some of us today. Got to thinking about these last two years and how so many of us with these lingering effects of, of viruses and, and economic hardship and all that, how many people, I wonder, feel as empty as that deserted stadium behind me? 
How many people today have no cheerleaders because of a virus? Or because families turned against them because they have a different opinion? Or because the boss says, you don't need to come in today, your job's been eliminated? How many people have no support? How many people are so hungry for God's love? And life feels futile and vain and they're missing kingdom purpose. And so what they do is they try every day to grab some excitement to get them through. But it fades. Because that adrenaline rush doesn't satisfy. <laughs> it never will. It wasn't designed to. And then when they come home in the quiet, all they hear is the whoosh of another page on the calendar going by. They're everywhere good people who are lost, good people who need to know the peace and the purpose that Jesus offers. Like you, I want you to realize that is not what the Lord intends. Jesus offers you peace. He offers you purpose before we do anything. You do not have to earn his favor. You do not have to earn his grace. You can't earn it. Our best works are as filthy rags. That's why it's a gift. He gives us the abundant life, takes our sin, gives us blessing and purpose, a life of service, being able to bless other people. So how are you doing with that? You see the challenge? This week, last week, next week, as we redeem the time? This Wednesday night, I want to invite you back because we're going to go even deeper into this. We're going to talk about how to say no in a godly way so you can say yes to the God-sized tasks he's given us. It's going to be powerful. I hope you can make it this Wednesday night. I'll be teaching a lot more on that. So, uh, Pastor Bill, why don't you come on up, brother? I'm going to give you just a, a few minutes. I'll take all the time you need. I, I ended early enough. Y'all are going to get out just early enough to beat the Methodists and the Lutherans to the feeding trough. So, we are in good shape. I'm excited to hear the updates you got, brother. Take it away. I'm going to ask if you would put those uh, three principles back up I was, as I was looking at those. I'm going to relate those to a couple of announcements that you'd be able to apply what Matt was talking about these last couple of weeks uh, in your individual life. He has that first principle, we start with the what? Start word. with the word. If you want to maximize your time, redeem your time, be used of God to really uh, your full potential, we need to be in the word of God. Keeping that in mind, there was a, a sheet that was put uh, in front of you uh, that focusing on the small groups that we have that meet uh, on Sunday morning. There's a woman's small group, all right, Amy. Amy, stand up. Amy teaches that, all right, yep. That, <laughs> so maybe somebody doesn't know who Amy is. And uh, they meet at the East Campus, all right, that's the other end. And uh, they're in the Word of God and uh, teaching. I don't know what you're teaching right now. But uh, again, you can see her, but remember that at 9.15. And then we have a mixed group that I teach along with uh, Roy Shaver, uh, also in the East Campus. Now, the reason I asked uh, Matt to be able to make this announcement is we're starting a new study in that mixed group on the Messiah and the Feast of Israel. Most people don't understand you cannot really interpret the gospel or your Bible unless you know the Jewish context. Most people don't know in history, the early church, first century, second century, third century, really celebrated, all right, the Feast of Israel. The, uh, really, uh, the gospel, all right, the message and the Messiah, Jesus Christ, all right, are fulfillment of everything that was promised, all right, to the nation of Israel. And so we're going to be going uh, through that and understanding, all right, the meaning, seeing Christ in that. And then on Palm Sunday, Sunday before Easter, we are going to do a Jewish Seder, all right, part of our class, that showing really what actually happened, what we know was the Last Supper, as Jesus met with his disciples, practiced uh, that, and how he changed it, and how that it proclaims our Savior in those truths. So I'm going to invite you to the Sunday school class. Uh, we start teaching, uh, start actually teaching at 9.30, but if you get there at 9.15, we have a prayer time. So remember those two things also. I'll just reiterate uh, a Wednesday night also, time to be in the Word of God. We'll focus on the Word. I figure it this way. If I'm going to be here Sunday anyhow, just come a little early, 
and I'm there for the small group and for church, so please remember that. Uh, the second principle, I already forgot it. I can tell you about it. All right, your yeses. Here's the yes, all right? Another ministry we have is at 1010 on Sunday mornings, we have a prayer room in the back, second room on your left, where we meet 10 minutes and we pray for the services. Do you believe God answers prayer? You believe God wants us to pray, all right? You believe Matt needs prayer, all right, as he proclaims the word of God. Nothing is done spiritually lasting unless it is done through the power of God. We all need prayer, all right? This, so I ask you to join me. I'm in there, all right? Ten minutes, instead of sitting maybe here, take those ten minutes. You still have time to see people, but please remember that. All right, the last announcement I want to make is we're making the announcement that this summer we're going to be going back to Ghana. You know, it's the tentative dates that are there. Uh, for those that are new, we uh, do a mission trip usually every other year, all right, uh, to Ghana. We do it uh, in connection with a special needs school in Ghana with severely handicapped children and children uh, in that area. We ministered to thousands, all right, of boys and girls. We were there last summer. Did not plan on going this summer. Somehow, you know, God dealing with me, in other words, maybe we should go because of the situation, and I was praying for about two weeks, all right? God, what do you want me to do? And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, one of my sons, Bill, middle son, ministry, all right, calls me and ends up saying, Dad, me, my wife and your grandson Will, all right, we're going with you this summer. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. I didn't know I was going. Right? <laughs> right? And I had been praying. So I guess I'm going this summer. Right? <laughs> it ends up, all right, and I had somebody else already commit without even announcing. But maybe God is dealing with you, all right? The last principle was unit presence. Maybe that's where God wants you to be, all right? Not trying to convince you in anything. All that I know this, all right, that a trip, all right, on focus like this in missions can change your life, all right? Uh, and I just urge you, just pray what God's will is. Uh, there are brochures more extensive in the back. Uh, you can see me. I'll give you whatever information that you would need. I tried to adjust the trip this time. So basically, instead of a long trip, it'll be basically one week with the two weekends, you know, on either side. So, and uh, again, if you have questions on that, you can see me, all right? So three things you can think about in applying those principles uh, to your life. I'm going to ask that we stand. We're going to close in a word of prayer. I'll remain here if you have any questions, all right, either about the Sunday school class or the missions uh, trip. Uh, at this time, I can uh, uh, answer them for you or any time in the weeks ahead. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you again. I thank you for the gift of time, the gift of life. I thank you for the opportunities that you lay before us. I thank you, dear Lord, for, dear Lord, the blessing that you allow us to be used by you in your ministry, reaching out to a lost and dying world and to men and women and boys and girls around us. I pray, dear Lord, that your focus for our lives would be our focus for our lives. I pray, dear Lord, we would not be a distracted people, but that we'd be a focused people, focused on you and your will. I pray for your leading for us as individuals, for us as families, for us as a church. May we be about your work, and may our lives and this ministry be well-pleasing before you. Watch over us until we meet again, for we ask your blessing, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.